Now you can be seated. Boy, you obeyed better in the first service. I couldn't get them to sit down. Well, it's so good to be here with you. I say this is my yearly visit. I, if they don't call me, I just call them and say, how about these dates? <laughs> Dave, would you stand up and let everybody see how good looking you are? <laughs> Dave and I have been married 52 years. And, um, let's just say it's been a journey. God has changed me quite a bit over those years, and he says sometimes he feels like he's been married to 20 different women <laughs> because I change a little bit, and then he gets used to me, and then God makes me a little better, and then he's got to get used to me. So the good news is, is God's always changing us and making us better if we want to cooperate with him. Amen? Amen. We have um, our 12th grandchild is in the womb right now. And so we have four children, two son-in-laws, two daughter-in-laws, about to have 12 grandbabies, two great-grandbabies, and all I can say is it's expensive. <laughs> I mean, I have to buy something like 24 or 25 just birthday cards every year. And of course, you know, when they all get to a certain age, then they want money, just, just money. So I hope you're all doing well and uh, what I wanna share with you tonight, I'm gonna to be bold enough to say that <clears throat> it may be one of the most important messages you've ever heard. <clears throat> and it's gonna be probably one of the simplest messages you've ever heard. If you're listening, and you know, you can sit here and not listen, but if you're listening, if somebody asked you tomorrow afternoon, what did Joyce preach on last night? You will be able to tell them. Don't you feel kind of foolish when somebody asks you what the message was and you go, well, it was good, but I, I don't really remember what it was. I wanna to talk to you about something tonight that radically, I mean radically affected my life. And actually I'll say that if I would not have learned this or let God teach it to me, I don't think I would be here today. When we first started our ministry, I say our own ministry, it's not our own, it belongs to God, but the, I've been in ministry 42 years, I've been teaching the word, but we've had Joyce Meyer Ministries for 32 years plus. Five years I taught home Bible studies and about 20, 25 people average each week came to that. And then for five years, I worked at a church in St. Louis and uh, learned a lot there. And then we had a word from the Lord, take your ministry now and go north, south, east, and west. Well, the problem was nobody knew us north, south, east, or west. And so we were just obedient to God and we went to north St. Louis, east St. Louis, west St. Louis, <laughs> and south St. Louis. Literally, you can find a way to obey God. And so it's been a long journey and we had a big vision, but everything was little. And God spoke to my heart, three things I'm gonna tell you to do and if you do them, I'll bless your ministry. And when God spoke these three things to me, I'll be honest and say that I probably didn't fully comprehend or understand what they were but he taught me over the next several years and still continues to teach me. He said, I want you to be a person of integrity. Be honest. Don't ever play games with any of the money that I put through your hands. Use it for what you say you're gonna use it for. Be a person of excellence. Do what you do with excellence. And that's the part I'm gonna to talk to you mostly about tonight. Because an excellent person doesn't just do what they have to, they always go the extra mile. They always do a little bit more than what they have to do. And we don't have a lot of that in the world today. It's very difficult to get a quality job. I don't mean to go get a quality job, but to get somebody to do a quality job. It's uh, 
it's almost getting to be commonplace that people don't keep appointments. Don't, don't you just love it when you have to take off work to meet a repairman and then he doesn't show up, doesn't show up, doesn't show up and doesn't even bother to call and tell you that he's not going to show up and then you call the place and ask where he's at. Oh, he, he got behind and he's not gonna make it today. And here you've taken off work for a whole day and still don't have what you needed. Well, I lived in times when people didn't do that. I was a teenager in the 50s and, and uh, th those were pretty good times. Good in that people had morals, they still considered honor to be something that you wanted to have. People had manners. And I'm talking about even people that weren't so-called Christians had manners. Men didn't curse in front of women. I mean, if they cursed a blue streak everywhere else when they got around a woman, they didn't do it. And if they did, they apologized. And I'm glad that I lived in those days, but it really makes me sad to see how far from that we have fallen. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about the world, I'm talking about Christians as well, and not all, obviously, many of you are committed to excellence. You're great, you keep your word, you do what you say you're gonna do, but there's a lot of Christians that don't and I think it'd be pretty safe to say there's probably more that don't than those that do. And so we have to learn that we have to set the standard, not follow the standard that's already out there. We're supposed to be leaders and examples, not followers. You know what Jesus said? You're in the world, but you're not of the world. In the world, but not of it. In other words, you're gonna live here but you can't be like everybody else. And so we all wanna be liked, we all wanna be accepted. And I can just pretty well tell you if, if you make a really full, wholehearted commitment to God and to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you are gonna have some people that are not gonna to wanna to be your friends anymore but I'd rather be popular in heaven than to be popular here on earth. Amen? So he said, be a person of integrity, do what you do with excellence and keep the strife out of your life, out of your ministry and out of your life. Well, we have really worked hard at maintaining those things over the last 30 some odd years and I think that we have a really, really excellent ministry and an excellent staff. And I'm gonna read you a story that I didn't get to read in the first service, just to, just to make a point. Because I believe what's on the head comes down on the body. Don't you? How many of you believe if you go in a bathroom at a restaurant and it's filthy, that it's not really a problem with the person who's assigned to clean them it's a problem with the management because it's up to them to make sure that things are done right. And if they don't set that example, then people under them won't call. Now remember, an excellent person always goes the extra mile. Well, we got this letter into the office and it just blessed me so much. I mean, for a long time, I couldn't read this without just crying like a baby and I very rarely do that, but it said, Sarah wrote into the ministry via Facebook and said, I was sexually assaulted and now I'm pregnant and I'm trying to decide whether to carry the baby or abort it. The ministry replied by email with prayer and scriptures to encourage her. We then followed up a couple of days later with another email letting her know we would like to physically call her to pray with her and ask if we could have her phone number. Sarah's one sentence reply before giving her number said, I'm stunned that you care enough to email me back and are even willing to talk to me. God works through that phone call in a miraculous way and Sarah gave her life to Christ. Now I want you to keep in mind that whoever it was that answered this email really was not 
required as part of her job to do anything other than answer the email. She wasn't going to make any more money if she went the extra mile, but because we've taught people this and we have people who, what, what we try to get into our people is we're here to help people, not to just be a big well-known ministry. Every person that calls in here is somebody that God cares about. And I want every piece of mail that comes into this place answered in some way, shape or form. And if we tell somebody we're gonna pray for them, then I want them to be prayed for. And so you know, there's a lot of stories I could get into, but I, this just one really blessed me. I'm stunned that you care enough to email me back. Well, God worked through that phone call in a miraculous way. Sarah gave her life to Christ. When we followed up again by email to celebrate her new life and provided links to everyday answers section on our website and other online resources, she responded by saying, I had been suicidal the night I felt compelled to click on your Facebook link to prayer. I had my death all planned out. Then you emailed and you emailed again. For the first time in my life, I felt loved. Now see, th th here's the thing we've got to understand. You are around people all the time out in the world. You can reach people that the few of us on the platform can't reach. And most of the people who need Christ are not coming to church to find him. But they are looking at people who claim to know him. And love should be our main theme in the church. Above everything that you study and read on, you should study on love. Because when it all comes right down to it, that's really what we're called to do, is love God, love ourselves, and love other people. Not love yourself in a selfish, self-centered way, but love yourself because God loves you. Because if you're against yourself, you're not gonna really show any love to other people. You cannot give away what you don't have. So to receive God's love means that you learn to accept and love yourself. And so she said, for the first time in my life, I felt loved. Now that's just sad, but the world is full of people like that. After talking to you, I, couldn't, I could not go through with the suicide I had planned. I was still confused and certain I would be aborting the baby, but after you sent scriptures, emailed again, and called, my world changed forever. This is cool. As I prayed on the phone to become a Christian, I felt what I can only describe as a blanket of peace in my room. I know that sounds crazy, but a heavy feather-like blanket descended on me. Then when the lady who called prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit, a cool breeze swept in through my room. I have no idea what it was, but literally a breeze came in and my hair was moved by the breeze. The windows weren't open and it's 95 degrees here, yet a breeze came over me with the blanket. It was as if God was with me in the room. Is that crazy? Question mark. Because I've never experienced anything like that before. Okay, so she couldn't have been making it up because she didn't even know what was happening. But these are the things, see, the Holy Spirit can move in miraculous ways if what we're doing is really being done out of love and with the right motivation. We have to stop living to impress people and really genuinely care about them. Well, she said, now I feel like I can live and my baby will live. You showered me with love and acceptance and honestly saved my life and my baby's life. Thank you so much. I ask that you'll continue to pray as I learn who I am and begin to be a mama. Joyce Meyer Ministries has since sent Sarah a Bible and we are providing her with tickets for the Love Life Women's Conference in September. In her last email, Sarah wrote, I'm so excited to get my very own Bible. I've never ever had one before. I'm reading the scriptures that you sent and I can't get enough of them. I'm even reading them to the baby too. Now, I tell you that just as an example of what it means to go the extra mile. You see, if she didn't really care about those people contacting the ministry, then she would have just done what her job required 
and she would have gone no further. Like I said, she wasn't gonna make any more money for doing all that extra stuff. I wouldn't have even known what she did if somebody wouldn't have sent that in and then somebody by somebody by somebody by somebody got it to me. And I believe that God let me see that just to show me that we do have an excellent staff <clears throat> who genuinely care <clears throat> about people. <clears throat> you got some tree here that's called a choking tree and I think it's like, <clears throat> <clears throat> all right. So, what is strife? Strife is an angry undercurrent. It's bickering, arguing, heated disagreement, but you can have strife and nobody be yelling at somebody. And sad to say in many churches, there's strife underneath. People may come and listen to the pastor and then go eat him for lunch. Come on. The worship team sings pretty songs but several of them think they have got a better voice than the worship leader and they should be leading the worship. And so they talk about the worship leader to other people. And I'll tell you what happens if something like that is not stopped, it'll end up killing the anointing on church. And you can put on the greatest show in the world, but if there's no anointing, nothing is gonna happen in the people's lives. You know, you're not changed because we have a great media presentation and a light show. And my, my goodness, in my conferences, we have smoke machines. We've got it all. You know, it's like, whoo. But that's still not what changes people's lives. The only thing that changes life is God's anointing. And the only way we're going to have that is if we keep the strife out of our life, if we're people of integrity and people of excellence. Amen. Now, to be a person of integrity means that you're gonna keep your word. Wow, do we ever have a lot of that lacking today? I'll call you back in 30 minutes. <laughs> Haven't heard back in six months. <laughs> hey, I'll call you next week and we'll go out to lunch. You don't even intend to call and you don't even wanna to go to lunch. It's just something to say, to sound nice. Well, when God first spoke these things to me, as I said, I wasn't uh, really educated in what any of them were. And so God had to teach me. I wasn't able to go to Bible college, but I went to the school of the Holy Ghost. And honestly, I think that's the best one to go through. And I'll tell you what, God ran me through the ringer, so to speak. You say, well, what do you mean by that? God's a good God. Yes, he's a good God, and he's good enough to spank your little royal holy bottom if that's what he needs to do. Amen? And so God taught me a lot of lessons one, I remember we were in Jacksonville, Florida, visiting a couple. I'd been preaching at their church, and, you know, we kind of hit it off with them. I still remember their names were, well, I better not say that. Well, no, it won't go on TV here. <laughs> well, they might, you, you get everywhere, so they might hear it anyway, so I better not say their names. Uh, I'm getting wiser in my old age. <laughs> and so we'd had a good time, so when we got ready to leave, I said, hey, you guys ought to come to St. Louis sometime and we'll spend a, several days or a week together and we'll take you to see all the sights, you know, we'll go to the arch, we'll go to the zoo, maybe we'll go out to eat, we'll just have a great time. Well, to be honest, I didn't want them to come to St. Louis. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have time to spend a week with anybody. I barely knew what my name was. I was so busy back then trying to get the ministry started. I liked them, but I didn't like them that much that I wanted them to come <laughs> and stay with me that long. And so I didn't think anything about, hey, you guys come, you know, you know, you know how we are. I mean, you know how we are. And so about two weeks went by and the man called and he said, well, we're ready. 
And I said, ready for what? He said, well, you know, to come to St. Louis, like you said. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And so when I pretended to be happy and hung the phone up, I said to God, what am I gonna do? And he said, I'll tell you what you're gonna do. (laughs) You're gonna bring them to St. Louis and if you don't wanna keep them in your house, you pay to put them in a nice hotel and you spend the week with them. You take them wherever they wanna go, you sightsee with them, you take them out to eat, and you will learn not to say things you don't mean anymore. (laughs) And I'll never forget that because it really did teach me a lesson. Now, obviously, I didn't have to do what God said, but something else we're missing today that we need a lot more of is a reverential fear of God. I would venture to say that there's a fair number of people that have never heard a message on the reverential fear of God. I mean, I've, I've even had people say, well, I don't understand that. I thought, you know, God was good and he loved us and, you know, we've got grace and forgiveness. And I don't, I don't understand what you mean. I don't think I should be afraid of God. I said, it's not that kind of fear. <laughs> it's a reverence. It's an awe for God that you know he's God and that he knows everything and can do everything and he sees everything. And see, everything we do when nobody's looking, God sees. I'm gonna say that again, because getting that revelation in your life will change your behavior. I mean, it honestly will. If if we can realize that everything we do, God sees it. Come on, everything we do, God sees it. And if we can learn to live before an audience of one, realizing that we're here for his glory, and by the way, you know what the word glory means? It means the manifestation of all of the excellencies of God. So when we say, Lord, I glorify your name, what we're really saying is I behave with such excellence that I am making you famous, amen? Amen. (laughs) People are watching us and we need to realize that. No strife, be a person of integrity, be a person of excellence. The thing that frightens me today is we live now in times when one and maybe two are going on three generations are here on the earth who never grew up with these principles. They're not teaching them in school. (laughs) I mean, if when we were in school, when I was in school, if I would have done some of the things that kids do in school today. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that is (laughs) right. Yeah. But then, what do you expect from the kids if you've got a teacher cussing in the classroom? <clears throat> so, I, to be honest, we have a mess. And God is the only one <clears throat> that can unravel it. But we're partners with God, and He gives us a part to play. And I'm hoping that the message that I'm speaking here tonight will in some way, shape, or form convict every person here and all the other places that you're watching to come up higher in at least one area of your life. Just just one area you're gonna come up higher. We're gonna set the standard, not follow the standard. Several months ago on one of my conferences I taught a version of the message that I'm teaching here tonight. And one of our speakers 
stayed to hear me speak, and he came to me afterwards, and he said, now, I mean, this is a well-known speaker that's been in church all of his life, and he's a man that's probably close to 40, and he said, I have never in my life heard anything like that. And I just taught a pretty simple message on being a person of excellence. Gave a bunch of practical examples, which I'll do here tonight. And he said, can I come home and live with you for a while? <laughs> One of the reasons why I believe we do have a ministry of excellence is because we taught that to our children and our two sons are the two CEOs of the ministry. One of them runs the world missions and one runs all the other business aspects of the media and the operations and so on and so forth. Don't tell your kids one thing and then let them see you doing something else. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> don't tell them not to lie and then when somebody calls that you don't wanna to talk to, tell your kids, tell them I'm not home. You say, oh, come on, I, I came here to hear something deep. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, this is about as deep as it gets, but it's deep enough to change your life if you're willing to go there. I think half the time we wanna hear something that's so like over our head and sounds so amazing that we can just go out and say, wow. <laughs> but we don't even know what we heard. Well, you'll remember this one. And so, how can somebody be in church 30 plus years and never hear a message on being excellent? I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. If God wouldn't have taught me these things, I honestly don't believe that I would be here today doing what I'm doing. In 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1, 3, <clears throat> the Bible says, for his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us, <laughs> you wanna know what your calling is? Here it comes. Who called us by and to his own glory and excellence. So we are called to be excellent. 1 Peter 2, 9 says basically the same thing. There's a man in the Bible named Daniel that <clears throat> was an excellent man. In the very first chapter, the eighth verse, we see that he refuses to compromise. He'd made a vow to God about what he would and wouldn't eat and they wanted him to eat all these rich, dainty foods. And he literally could have lost his life by refusing to eat those things. But he was willing to do even that rather than break his word to God. And so, God gave him favor. See, if you're willing to do the right thing, the devil is gonna try to make you afraid that you're gonna lose your job, you're gonna lose your friends, or something bad's gonna happen to you if you do the right thing. But the truth is, is no matter what the devil tries to do, if God decides to promote you, you're promoted. And if God gives you favor, you've got favor. And when you have the favor of God on your life, mm -mm, some good things begin to happen. And so Daniel also had excellent friends. You've heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not compromise, even if it meant their life. And the thing is, is who you hang out with is very important because if you're around somebody enough, what's on them is going to get off on you. Right. Amen. Amen. And some of you probably could change your life drastically just by getting a new group. I'll just leave that with you. Now, because I want this to be very practical, I'm going to get to some practical things. If you're not handicapped, don't park in a handicapped parking space. <laughs> and especially don't do it at church. 
And I bet you that we've got people in here tonight that have pulled into this parking lot late, couldn't find a parking space, and you've pulled into a handicapped parking space. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands because then you'd be tempted to lie and I don't wanna be responsible for that. Well, they got too many of those handicapped parking spaces anyway. <laughs> if we'd stop making excuses for our disobedience and just call it what it is. By the way, I love you guys. There's so many scriptures that talk about this. If I had another two hours, we could go through every one of them, but the Bible, the Bible not only says to walk in love, it says to abound in walking in love. So even if you are a fairly loving person, we can't be content there. We have to always want to grow. We have to always want to be better. Paul said, excel in giving. And he was talking to people that were givers. But he said, excel and go on and do even more in this area. The more we do of what's right, the more happy and peaceful we're gonna be and the greater reward is gonna come in our lives. <clears throat> if you have a bumper sticker on your car declaring that you're a Christian, please don't break the speed limit. <laughs> Roll your window down and throw trash out of it. And make nasty signs at people. <laughs> we won't explain that any further. When you use the last of the toilet paper on the roll, You're like, now you gotta be kidding me, lady. I, didn't, I did not come all the way over here and fight this traffic to hear you talk about toilet paper. Well, some of you need to hear this. Oh, the next person will get it. Well, but don't you hate it? When you go into a bathroom and there is no toilet paper on the roll. So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And listen, if you don't need this, I'll preach to myself because I need it. When I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I am so sleepy. And I realize that when I use the little bit of toilet paper on that roll, that there's gonna be none left for Dave when he gets up. And because I love God, I replace the toilet paper. <laughs> See, instead of just telling God we love him, we need to start acting like we do by being the kind of person he wants us to be. When you use a public restroom, do not tinkle all over the seat and not clean it up. There is nothing that annoys me worse. I have to use a lot of public restrooms because I travel a lot and I hate it when I go in. I have to go in four or five before I can find one clean enough to sit down on. Come on, is this okay? Yeah. Don't let your dog go number two on your neighbor's yard and not clean it up. When you open your car door, don't throw it open and nick the paint. Hmm. You have an excellent attitude when the clerk at the store makes a mistake and has to go back and re-ring your 45 items. Do you treat her like she's valuable and act like 
you think Jesus would act? <laughs> or do you do what I used to do? <sighs> well, now I'm going to be late for my next appointment with my rhinestone Jesus pen flash. <laughs> Now, God taught me a lot for some reason in the grocery store. I went to the grocery store about three times a week. My kids were all little then. and We were very, very tight on money. And so I clipped every coupon that I could find where I could get any kind of a deal. Well, you know, there's fine print on coupons, but interestingly enough, until I received the Holy Spirit... I didn't read the fine print, but when you get hooked up with God, he will lead you to the fine print. <laughs> How many of you know the fine print can get you in trouble? And so I noticed, because I, I loved it when chickens were on sale. And I, it said on the coupon, which I never noticed before, limit three per family. Not even three per person, three per family. Please. Well, I did not want three chickens. I wanted a bunch of free chickens, not free, but cheap chickens. And so I would take my kids with me and we'd all get three chickens and all get different carts and all get in different lines and pretend like we didn't know each other. Come on, is there anybody in the house that knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so one day I was standing there and I thought, I don't think I gave my daughter enough money for tax. And my heart started pounding in fear. Now, I'm teaching this like 25-person Bible study in my home. And God's teaching me how to be excellent, be a person of integrity, and so on and so forth. And so, he just said to me, don't you realize if you have to do this in fear, something's wrong with it? When I got through the checkout lane, he said, well, congratulations, Joyce, you just stole three chickens. <laughs> well, the first time, or one of the earlier times that I preached this message, I was in a church in Tennessee and the pastor sat on the platform with me, you know, behind me. So he was behind me the whole time I was preaching. And I told that story that I just told. And he jumped up and pointed to his wife on the front row. And he said, you have turned me into a thief. <laughs> but he said, it wasn't chickens, it was toilet paper and it was for the church. <laughs> Another thing God taught me was, you know, when you go in a grocery store, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff you really don't have to have is first. And then by the time you get over to the milk and the eggs and, you know, the stuff you really got to have, you've ran out of money, at least if you were like I was back then. I mean, I had to shop with my calculator and my coupons, and I had exactly $70 for every two weeks for groceries. And if I was going to be over that, I had to start putting stuff back. Well, until I really let God have full play in my life. Whatever I didn't want, I would take out of the cart and just put it wherever I was at in the store. You know, I'm the person who put the lettuce in the cleanser. <laughs> Do you ever find items in strange places and think, what is that, what is that? It was me. And so then God started making me, and when I say making me, he didn't like force me, but I was committed to trying to learn to do what I felt like God really wanted me to do. So he would make me walk every item 
You, you know how it is when, you, when the Holy Ghost is in you and you're really trying to be led by the Spirit? It's, you don't even have to have any words. It's like that look that your mother gives you. And I finally learned it was better to just go do what he said than to have it nagging at me all day. Because sometimes God can be a nag. I mean, he would just keep it up and keep it up and keep it up and keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. And if you don't pass that test, you will get to take it again. And then one last story, my grocery cart. I know that most of you have heard the grocery cart story, but you're just gonna have to indulge me and let me tell it again. This is so amazing to me because, you know, I was one of those people, I didn't wanna go put my grocery cart back in the space marked off for grocery carts. I wanted to lean it against a pole or prop it on the other carts that were out in the middle of nowhere. And I would, kick the wheels and you know, try to get them so the thing wouldn't roll away. Then you'd start to walk off and it would start to roll so you'd go back. And... <laughs> Don't you love it when you come out of the store and there's two or three grocery carts leaned against your car and one of them scratched your paint? Well, it was people like me who did that. I didn't want it done to me. but I did it to other people. So God started dealing with me to go put the thing back where it was supposed to be. Well, they've got people that do that. Well, they're asking you to do it, then it won't cost as much to run the store. <laughs> then the prices won't be so high. But here's the sad thing. <clears throat> it took me two years, two years. Now we're talking, this is 40 years ago. I'm grateful I can say that, but it took me two years to get to the point where I would go put it back every single time. I started out, I'd do it if the weather was good, if it wasn't raining, wasn't snowing, wasn't cold, the wind wasn't blowing. <laughs> Am I the only one who does these kind of things? Do I have anybody else out there that feels you've been kind of caught? And, and I can say this and mean it with my whole heart. I honestly believe if I would never have learned to put my grocery cart back where it was supposed to go, I don't think I'd be here today. That's how important it is that you hear what I'm saying tonight. We need to come up higher and we need to be excellent people who represent the God that we say that we serve and love in a way that he deserves. Somebody give God a praise tonight. How many of you will know tomorrow afternoon what I preached on tonight? All right. Has anybody thought of a, at least one area where you could maybe make a little change? Well, then I think my job is done. Let me pray for you and then Todd's gonna come. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word tonight, so simple but yet so powerful. I thank you for reminding me again of the kind of person you want me to be. And I pray, Lord, for everybody here that they heard and that they will obey. Lead and guide each person in what you would have them do to come up higher and help them never forget how important it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Todd's gonna come back. Thank you so much.